Let's start with a summary of oxidation reduction reactions. Redox reactions involve the transfer of electrons from one species to another. The substance that gains electrons is said to be reduced, while the substance that loses electrons is said to be oxidized. In the reaction that's shown, the copper metal atom loses an electron to become copper plus one. Therefore, copper, in losing that electron, got oxidized. It loses the electron to the silver ion, which becomes then silver metal. It, the silver gains the electron, meaning that the silver plus ion got reduced. In order to keep track of which species loses electrons and which gains them, we assign oxidation numbers to individual atoms in the reaction. Here's a summary of how we might assign oxidation numbers. Elements in their elemental form always have an oxidation number of zero. For a compound, the sum of the oxidation numbers in a neutral compound is zero. For a monatomic ion, the oxidation number is always the same as its charge. For a polyatomic ion, the sum of the oxidation numbers is always the charge of the ion. Hydrogen has a minus one oxidation number when bonded to a metal and a positive one when bonded to a nonmetal. Fluorine always has an oxidation number of minus one. The other halogens are usually minus one, but in an oxyanion, so that's an anion that includes oxygen, they may have a positive oxidation number. Nonmetals usually have negative oxidation numbers, although in certain compounds or ions, they're positive. And oxygen has an oxidation number of minus two, except in the peroxide ion, which is H2O2 ion. In that case, the oxygen is minus one. All right, so this table shows a summary of the two halves of what's happening. So the first half reaction is the oxidation. That's the losing of electrons. So losing electrons is oxidation, or we have the um, abbreviation LEO there. In that case, the oxidation state increases or becomes more positive. Um, and as you can see here, the electrons are the product. We've lost an electron here. Reduction, the other half of the reaction, is the gaining of electrons. So gaining electrons is reduction, which is where we get this abbreviation GER. And the oxidation state decreases, or the number becomes more negative as electrons are gained. And electrons are a reactant. So this magnesium ion gains two electrons to uh, become Mg solid. You can remember it through the mnemonic device of Leo the lion says Ger. Another one, I'll just give you in case you've seen it, is oil, O-I-L, rig, which means oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain. All right, so one thing to note is that redox reactions don't happen in isolation. You can't have an oxidation reaction without simultaneously having a reduction reaction. So any substance that gets oxidized is called a reducing agent or reducer because the electrons lost in the oxidation will be gained by another species. Good reducing agents must easily lose their electrons. Neutral metals or substances with low ionization energies fit the bill, as shown by the examples. Any substance that gets reduced is called an oxidizing agent or oxidizer because the electrons gained will be lost by another species. They must come from somewhere. Good oxidizing agents must gain electrons easily. Neutral or positive nonmetals or highly positive metals fit the bill here. So you can see some of those here. Reducing agents are oxidized, oxidizing agents are reduced. All right, let's go over how we balance redox reactions using the half reaction method. In a redox reaction, both the atoms and the electrons must be balanced. So let's look at this example. Let's start with the copper. So we start with copper two plus. 
and we can see just by following this blue arrow that it gains two electrons in order to become a neutrally charged metal here. Silver starts out as a solid and loses one electron to become a plus one ion. So even though there is one of each atom on each side, the equation is not balanced because the number of electrons lost does not equal the number of electrons gained. In this case, the case this can be changed by reacting more silver atoms so more electrons are lost. So if we simply just add a second silver, now we lose two electrons, one for each of those silver atoms to form two silver ions. And so now we've gained two electrons and where did they go? Or where did they come from? They came from the, each of these silver atoms losing two electrons. As we've talked about in a previous presentation, chemical reactions are classified by what process is occurring by means of the reaction. Precipitation reactions inv involve the formation of a solid from mixing two aqueous solutions. There's a net ionic equation shown for the formation of cobalt two hydroxide. Acid base reactions ex involve an exchange of um, hydronium ions or H plus ions as shown in the neutralization reaction of ammonium with hydroxide. Redox reactions involve the exchange of electrons, as you can see in the example where magnesium loses two electrons, zinc gains those two electrons to form the two different products. There are a few reactions that do not neatly fit into one of these categories that we will deal with later. There's a special type of oxidation reduction reaction called a disproportionation reaction. In a disproportionation reaction, the same element becomes both oxidized and reduced. So let's look at this example here where we have these oxidation states. Chlorine is minus one, okay? And because there are two of them, that means each of these mercuries must be plus one. Now on the product side, we have mercury in its elemental form, so it has an oxidation state of zero. Chlorine again is minus one. If there are two of them, then this mercury must be plus two to balance it out. So in this case, mercury is both oxidized, first going from plus one to plus two, okay, so losing an electron, and reduced, it gains an electron and going from plus one to zero. So we call this a disproportionation reaction. Let's talk now about what we might see in a lab when performing a redox reaction inside of an electrochemical or voltaic cell. If we separate the two half reactions into separate beakers, we can capture the electric energy generated by the flow of electrons between the two half reactions. Remember that these reactions don't occur in isolation. If electrons are lost by one species, they are gained by the other. The energy released in a spontaneous reaction can be used to perform electrical work. Such a setup through which we can transfer electrons is called a voltaic, galvanic, or electrochemical cell. It is also called a battery. In the reaction we're gonna discuss in the next several slides, we have zinc metal plus copper two plus, that means copper in the solution producing the zinc two plus plus copper metal, okay? All right, so how do we set up this electrochemical cell? So we start out by putting the solids, the copper metal and the zinc metal in two different beakers. The oxidation reaction that happens at the zinc results in excess electrons on the zinc electrode. That gives, so what's happening here, the oxidation is happening where zinc metal becomes zinc two plus and then it loses those two electrons, okay? So the zinc has a relatively negative electric charge repelling electrons or moving them through the circuit. The copper electrode has a relatively positive charge attracting electrons through the circuit. The source of the electrons is called the anode, and oxidation is what occurs at the anode, and the sink of the electrons, or where they go to, is called the cathode, 
reduction occurs at the cathode. The anode is always the electrode at which oxidation occurs. The cathode is always the electrode at which reduction occurs. So we can see that here. Electrons are flowing, and so um, reduction occurs here where the electrons are transferred to there. So the gain of electrons happens here, which is reduction. Um, this can be remembered by using the mnemonic anox red cat, where anode is oxidation, reduction is cathode. Electrons are generated at the anode and flow through the external circuit to the cathode, as demonstrated by this arrow here. One last note about the electrochemical cell as it relates to this salt bridge that you can see in the middle. The flow of electrons from the anode to the cathode leads to an imbalance of charge between the beakers. That would stop the reaction and the flow of electrons if not corrected. The correction is made by the addition of a salt bridge. The salt supplies the needed anions and cations that flow to the beakers to rebalance the charge. The anions and cations in the reaction do not move through the bridge, just those of the salt. So see how this says there's copper sulfate solution and zinc sulfate solution? So it just, um, this is a solution of copper ions and a solution of zinc ions. And um, with the addition of extra electrons, you can get a bunch of extras there. So we have this salt bridge made of potassium nitrate that allows the positive potassium to flow this way to balance out the excess electrons and the negatively charged nitrates to flow this way to balance out the loss of those electrons. Let's talk now about standard reduction potentials. Electrode potential is the tendency of an electrode to lose or gain electrons. In other words, it's its oxidation or reduction potential. By convention, the process is viewed as reduction and the values are reported as reduction potential. Standard reduction potentials, or E0 subscript RED for reduction, are calculated at standard conditions of 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere, and a concentration of one molar. These potentials lead to an electrochemical activity series. Standard reduction potential values provide a ranking system to determine which elements react more easily. Hydrogen is used as a reference point. The more negative the value, the less likely reduction will take place at that electrode and the more likely oxidation will. These are the most reactive metals. The more positive the value, the more likely reduction will take place at that electrode and the less likely oxidation will take place. These are the least reactive metals. Here's a chart that summarizes these reduction potentials. You can see hydrogen in blue right here in the middle, okay, as our reference point. As we go up, the values become more and more negative, okay, more and more negative. These are the most reactive of the metals, okay? So the top here, um, these are called strong reducing agents, okay? Strong reducing agents because they're most likely to become oxidized. They're most likely to lose their electrons and, and be the reducer. As we go this way, down the chart, the numbers get more positive. Okay, these are the most reactive. This is the most reactive of the non-metal here, fluorine. Okay, um, they have a very low tendency to lose electrons. Okay, they are weak reducing agents, which means they are very strongly oxidized. Okay, very strongly oxidized. Now we can create a similar pattern with the, so these are all reversible reactions, right? So we can look at the, the reactants here and essentially the reverse is true. 
Okay, so towards the bottom here, um, the the um, at the bottom left we would have a strong reducing agent, right, or a strong oxidizing agent. Sorry, or very um, easily reduced, right? Strong oxidizing agent means that that is being reduced. And then as we go up at the top left here, we have a low tendency to gain electrons. So that would be a weak oxidizing agent. One last summary on these reduction potentials and oxidizing and reducing agents. The strongest oxidizers have the most negative reduction potentials. They make better anodes. To remember, remember oxidation occurs at the anode and they both start with vowels. The strongest reducers have the most positive reduction potentials. They make better cathodes. To help remember, reduction and cathode both starts with consonants. So here's a, a, a few um, of those reduction potentials pulled from that larger chart and it's just flipped. You have most positive here going to most negative. So as you get more negative, these um, the, are the increasing strength of the reducing agents, and they make better cathodes. The other way is the increasing strength of the oxidizing agent, and they make better anodes. Cell potentials. Cell potential is an intensive property. It does not depend on the amount of substance and is not affected by reaction coefficients. The electric, electrochemical cell potential, E0 cell, can be calculated by the following equation, where E0 cell is equal to E0 times the reduction potential of the cathode minus the E0 reduction potential of the anode. So cathode minus the anode. The greater the difference between the two electrode potentials, the greater the voltage of the cell. For example, at the cathode, this reduction is taking place. This is the same example we've been seeing, where copper is being reduced, gaining these two electrons to become the copper solid. There's a standard reduction potential there equal to positive 0.34 volts. At the anode, oxidation is occurring where zinc 2 plus ions are gaining these two electrons to become zinc metal. That has a reduction potential equal to minus 0.76 volts. The E cell is just the difference between the cathode minus the anode. So 0.34 minus, and be careful of this negative sign here, negative 0.76 volts, which is positive 110 volts. The Gibbs free energy, remember that helps us predict spontaneity, so the Gibbs free energy delta G0 for a redox reaction under standard conditions is inversely proportional to the cell potential. If the cell potential is positive, the reaction will occur spontaneously.